So, good morning all. Um, know most of you and those that I don't know will see um, during the day. Is this going to work? No. Right. How do I... Got to change. Right, we'll get the technology sorted. I'll just give a bit of background. I've been asked to talk about um, avoiding magic and opting for science. And how this came about was a couple of years ago, Phil Holmes and I put out an opinion piece, really just to try and counter what we saw as a, a big wave of regenerative agriculture and magic solutions and this, that and the other, which sort of said, well, we need to forget about all the fundamentals, <coughs> all the stuff we've learned over time with those 13,000 reports that Jason mentioned. And um, someone's come out from Africa and said this works, or someone's written a book and said this works. We need to just focus on, on this. And um, that gets a bit of, bit of attention, and um, we thought we need to bring it back and look at you know, the importance of not just science, but bringing science and economics together. So we'll go through that. What I'll talk is um, yeah, the importance of science and economics, why it isn't an easy process, and it's not. Um, some silver bullets and distractions that are out there. Um, what I see is the continuum of conventional agriculture. I think that came up a bit in, in Jason's discussion then and in, in Haley's question. A bit of a pop quiz, what you can do and some suggested reading. So the importance of science and economics, I think that um, science and economics sort of underpins agriculture and life. Everything we've got now in terms of the the advances in um, the quality of life we live compared to two, three hundred years ago, the longevity, everything like that, science and economics has played a, um, a big role in that. And to, to realise that potential that Jason spoke about with all those global markets, growing population, growing demand, we're going to need as an industry science and economics or the application of science and economics to, to help meet that um, demand. And I see your role as livestock advisors, a key part of what you do is to marry that science, economics and the realities of production at the coalface. Your job is to bring all of them together and that's not easy either and we'll talk about that a bit more but that's, that's part of your key role, to be across that enough and help implement it at, um, at that level. You don't need to be a scientist or an economic, economist um, to be able to do it. You need to think an understanding of the, the disciplines and their principles and in some ways it's probably better um, if you're not and this is something I'll, I'll talk about. You as advisors need to be able to stand back and take a, a big picture view and not have a, a discipline specific view. Part of your role I think is to help distinguish between the potential and the reality. And that can be a bit tricky sometimes because we're all optimists. I think anyone involved in agriculture um, has to be an optimist and has to be optimistic, which is good. Um, and we want to see potential, we want to see opportunity, and that's good, but we need to, to come back to reality. So you need to have that difference between potential and reality whilst looking for the opportunity, being optimistic, seeing what news is out there, but knowing whether something is just potential or whether there's um, reality in it. So. What does science, and I'm not a scientist, um, I see that as the, the scientific process. Disproving the negative, you know, having a control group, replication, repeatability, peer review. I think it's very good that Dennis Poppy's here today. He'll take you through this in a, um, a lot more detail, which will be good. The economic side of it, and I'm not an economist either, is looking at the incremental benefits versus the incremental cost. Are we getting more back than what it's costing us to do this? Are we looking at economies of scale, opportunity cost, time value of money, those things. I'll go through them a bit more. Don't let them scare you. That's an important part of it. And that is where often the technical people fall down, is the economic side of it. But it's not as hard, um, or doesn't have to be hard. So this isn't an easy process, I don't think, in terms of your role, bringing the science and the economics together and linking it with production at the coalface. It is challenging. There's lots of existing research and literature um, Jason spoke about the 13,000 MLA reports that have been done. Came out last week, I think, that the annual number of peer-reviewed papers has gone from 20,000 a year to 100,000 a year, or something like that, which is astronomical. So that's a, a lot to get your head around. So, you know, you've got full-time academics that never see daylight, whose job is to getting across all of them, but you can't afford to spend all of the time getting across that, so you need to get across the important bits 
and have access to people who understand what's out there, but um, there is a lot of information out there. It is multidisciplinary. We like to sit in our silos of where we've been trained, but this has got to get us across disciplines into counselling, financial, environmental, economic, um, biological. Lots of different disciplines there. You can't be an expert in all of them, but you've got to have a working knowledge of them and I think an awareness of what you don't know is, an, is important as well. There are challenges with the traditional extension and adoption role and part of that I think is we've got very knowledgeable, very intelligent people that know a lot about their narrow area of expertise and they know a lot because they're focused on that and they go out and say, I can't understand why the producers don't see this narrow bit as extremely important and why they haven't applied everything that I've come up with over the last 20 years. But the producer isn't dismissive of it, and I think we need to make sure we're not putting them down too much, but the producers there going, OK, well, that's all well and good, but I've got to juggle the family side of it, the environmental side of it, the cash flow side of it, the bank side of it, this, that and the other. They've got a lot of balls in the air. And researchers come along and say, why aren't you just focusing on that one ball there? Well, I can't drop all of the others. So that juggle is important. That's part of your task is helping, I think, having an awareness of all of those balls so you can integrate what you're talking about into the overall system. And that's an important part there. It's complex and at times conflicting. Phosphorus is a good example, and we could have a, um, a big conversation on that, and there's people in the room that know far more about it than I do, but there is a lot of opportunity there, but you know, getting that baseline, how to test animals, there's conflicting bits of advice out there in the extension world on how to approach them, what test is effective, what's not, and that sort of thing. That does make it hard for the, um, for the producer. Um, the feedback loops in grazing industry are very slow and indirect. We um, feed phosphorus now, or even a longer example, we buy a bull now that's going to um, improve the, the gene pool. It's going to take a long time before we actually see the benefits of that come through, and it's hard to measure the specific change of that there. And if we have a run of good seasons, no matter what we did, it's going to be great. If we don't, it'll be bad. So it's hard to do that. Compare that to, to cropping or chooks or even lot feeding, where if we make an intervention, it's easy to measure that. So that's where we need to rely on the research that has been done, where things have been um, proven and be across what has and hasn't worked in the research. And I'll come to an example of that in a minute. And there are lots of distractions and silver bullets out there which say, well, you don't have to be across all of this science, all of this information, whether it works or not, just do this. Um, so, you know, they are very seductive, particularly given the complexity that we've got. Simply apply this process and you'll transform your business. It's all here. It worked in Africa. It'll work here. Um, or do this, whatever this is, and it'll double your stocking rates. Or put a drop of this in your trough and you're going to increase weight gains. Or the income streams from this will exceed your livestock income. They're all pretty appealing things. And say, so, OK, well, do we just run with them or get across all of this detail? So they are seductive. They don't require a lot of thinking. But mostly they're, um, they're hot air. And I think the abundance <coughs> of silver bullets is um, perhaps a result of something which I don't subscribe to. But I have heard this has actually come to me from a producer saying, you'll never go broke selling a farmer hope. Um, because they are eternal optimists, as are we, and I don't subscribe to it, but I think that increases the demand for, um, for silver bullets that are out there. But there are no silver bullets. I think it's got to all be underpinned by science and, um, and economics, and your job is to look at the, the potential versus the reality whilst looking at the opportunity that's out there. So some of the issues I've got with some of the new things that um, come in is they're saying... Conventional ag is all bad. If you're not on board this bandwagon, you're a dinosaur. You need to run with this. This is where the future's at. And it isn't binary. And I think being binary is a bit um, um, counterproductive, where not all of the new solutions are good. Aspects of them will be. There'll be aspects there that are well rooted in, in science or have a good scientific or economic underpinning. There'll be new stuff that'll come out of them, which may be applicable, which should be good. But they're not all good and not all of conventional agriculture is bad. And then conversely, not all of the new solutions are bad, nor conventional ag good. There's going to be bits in both of them to, to pick out, and each circumstance is going to be different. But this them and us, this new age versus conventional ag, I think is a bit divisive and disingenuous. 
I view, and this came up a bit in the discussion before, conventional ag as a bit of a continuum. <coughs> and the good old bell curve that you'd all be familiar with, and at one end we've got the tail. So, um, and that's a problem for the industry, I think, a big problem, um, mostly because um, I think market forces are too slow to work in agriculture. The inefficient operators are not forced out quick enough and that slows down evolution, um, which is a problem. And there's a conflict there with extension and adoption where some extension and adoption may be prolonging that um, rather than, than moving the bell curve. There's social implications if they leave. I think there's environmental implications if they stay in a lot of cases, those inefficient um, operations. Yeah, and those slow market forces impede evolution. And I think <coughs> this is probably going to sound a bit contradictory to what I said about the divisiveness before, but I think we can be a bit divisive here. I think industry solidarity, solidarity, solidarity is um, counterproductive in some ways. The industry likes to sort of sometimes circle the wagons a bit to, to protect their own. But these ones down here, which may make for good um, TV footage, a lot of cases with blowing dirt, dead stock and everything else, um, I think the industry needs to cut them loose and say, that's not us, that's them, they're doing it that way, but um, they're not the rest, because I think it'll drag industry down there. The other end, the lead, these lead focus on the fundamentals, and I'll go through them a bit more in a minute. <coughs> um, they apply the proven science, not immediately, but over time they do. If a good case be made for them, they can understand it, how to implement it into their business, um, they do, um, where they can be sure that the benefits exceed the costs, and they manage the majority of the herd in the landscape. So this bell curve is in terms of performance, but what we've found is this top 25% of the industry, the northern beef industry, manage half the herd and half the landscape and produce half the beef. They also make all the profits. The bottom 75%, um, in total, don't make profits. The line's about here, um, but those that are making money in the bottom 75% don't cancel out those that are. But if we put a full day on owner wages. So, what you do in the middle, um, back to Hayley's question before, I don't know, um, but um, the lead, I think, is where the, the focus is, and cutting off this tail will, um, will help, I think, in some ways. So, back to to science and economics, um, what, what does it all mean? Well, firstly, demand evidence. I like collecting little quotes, and um, one I quite like is that in God we trust, all others must bring data. So if something comes along, someone saying we should do this, say, OK, well, where's the science? Can I see the data from it? And all of you, well, there's many in the room that know more about this than I do, was the research undertaken by someone independent? Was there a control group? Have the results been replicated? Have the results been published? Were they peer reviewed? And other questions you'd have specific to that example to be able to, to, um, to look at that. Um, the economic side of it, and I've had numerous conversations with some people in this room where I think the economic side of it scares them and say, oh, well, I just don't understand it. And, but they're very knowledgeable in their technical area. And I understand that, but I say, don't, don't overthink it, um, because it's not, it doesn't have to be that complicated. What we're mainly looking at is, does it pay? Do the benefits exceed the costs? If they do, good. If they don't, bad. That's the, the crux of it. So we need to, and that's what a cost-benefit analysis is. We also need to look at things like time value of money. A dollar we spend today is worth a lot more to us than a dollar we get back in 10 years' time. So we need to account for that. Um, need to ask, has the opportunity cost of capital? If we've got to spend a lot of money on this, we need to get not just that money back, we need to get a return on that capital. We need to recoup that um, and get a return, as well as working capital. Um, that needs to be taken into account. And additional labour. We're going to be spending more time doing whatever it is we're looking at. That needs to be taken into account. So looking at all of them, and this is where... And there's lots of, and we're going to hear about some today, and I'm excited about it, there's lots of things that are out there. You know, carbon's getting a, um, <coughs> a lot of attention at the moment, and I think there's a lot of um, opportunity there, but the challenge is working out what's potential and what's reality. 
and there's a um, Haley's involved in a, in a good project which we're involved in where we're looking at that different environmental not just carbon environmental services across the spectrum saying okay what's the impact on the business what's it going to cost them what's the impact on the production system what benefits are they going to get in their production system but also from potential payments weighing those up and being able to look at it which I think is quite exciting so to have a break from me talking <coughs> I've got a pop quiz I'll just sort of throw in a few here that uh, things that come up quite often um, with um, different statements regarding the beef industry, which um, some of them are true. Or there's three options. There's um, a mixture of true and false in here, so we'll go through them. So what I want from you, and I'll have to get Joe or Ashley to explain how to use the, the app for this um, or the uh, QR code, is I want to know whether the following statements are true, false, or if the jury is out or undecided. So the first one, by reducing paddock size and distance to water, we're going to increase production because the animals don't expend as much energy walking around. Um, second one, giving electrolytes to cattle prior to trucking will reduce shrinkage during transportation. And the third one, stocking rate management is more important than grazing system in determining pasture and animal productivity. So you're a fairly intelligent looking bunch. This might um, um, not be worthwhile, but it would be interesting to go through and get your answers to this. So, by reducing paddock size and distance to water, 55% of you said that that was true, 32% false, 14% said jury still out. This one is pretty conclusive from the um, research that's out there, false. Not going to. A lot of different research has been done on distance that cattle walk. Two trials out of quite a lot had statistically significant results. One at VRD found a smaller paddock, they walked less, but that couldn't be replicated elsewhere. One on the Barclay found with more waters, they actually walked further, and that was statistically significant. But by and large, across the research that's been done in Northern Australia, Southern Australia, 10,000 hectare paddocks to 100 hectare paddocks, Cattle walk a similar distance each day, regardless of paddock size. So you are not going to get any production benefits from distance to water or um, paddock size. So, and I'll put up all of the references for these in a second. So that's false, but yeah, um, John MacGyver concluded in that one report, in broad terms, cattle walk a similar distance each day, irrespective of paddock size. So, as a group, you failed that one. <laughs> Okay, so giving electrolytes to cattle will reduce trucking, uh, reduce shrinkage during transport. 29% said true, 24% said false, 48% said the jury is still out. So you got this one as a group. So the jury is still out. It's inconclusive. A fair bit of work's been done on it. So I looked at this for a client <coughs> a couple of weeks ago. Couldn't find, and some of you may be aware of more modern stuff, I couldn't find much recent stuff, but that that had been done um, has found that it's inconclusive. Generally, the shrinkage was less when they were fed electrolytes, but um, it wasn't significant and wasn't always repeatable. So <clears throat> that's one we don't know yet. I'd be surprised if this was otherwise. So this one here, <clears throat> you got right. 82% said this one was true. Stocking rate's more important than grazing system. Um, false said 9% 9, 9 of you said that's false. 9% said the jury's still out. So a um, lot of research done on this, and there's people who know a lot more about it than me, but I've pulled up a, um, a quote from a report from Trevor Hall that says that um, research is consistently shown stocking rate management is the main driver of pasture and animal productivity rather than grazing system. So thank you, Ashley. So just a bit of an exercise there with you know some information that's out there and some things that are reasonably topical at the moment that um, aren't as clear cut as we've seen. But as a group, you got two out of three, right? So that was pretty good. Um, and yeah, if you disagree, um, bring the evidence. Go through what Dennis is going to talk about um, um, after me and you'll be able to um, yeah, mount a case, and that's what it should be about, exchange of ideas, not um, one's right, one's wrong. Um, in your notes there, 
these are the references to those reports where um, I pulled that from, if you want to have a look at it. So just to finish up, I want to talk a bit about the role of magic, because with some of these alternate systems, there's an element of magic in there. So don't worry about the science, it just works. It's great. You sprinkle this fairy dust and all this stuff happens. So, um, and it is, yeah, appealing, or well, there's secrets. We've got the secret of this or the secret of that. And I think there's no place for magic in modern agriculture beyond Mother Nature. That's magic enough. Other than that, we should be able to have an explanation for things. So what can you do in your roles? <coughs> I think know the fundamentals and have an unrelenting focus on this, on them. It's not really sexy, but it's not boring either because there's a lot there to continually get your head across. And this is what those top performers on the bell curve, what they do. They focus on the fundamentals. So for northern beef, it's matching your stocking rate to, to carrying capacity and include wet season spelling in that. To do that, we need to know our cattle numbers. Jason spoke before about people not knowing where they live being a problem. People not knowing how many cattle they've got is a problem, which you would all experience, but it is the main problem in the north. You go across the north, the socially acceptable figures are 75 to 80% weaning, 2 to 3% mortality. Therefore, job right. We don't have a fertility problem. We don't have a mortality problem. But you look at the... The data, there's been a few good bits of work done. Cash cow, Steve Vanny was involved in a, a good piece nearly 10 years ago on breeder cow mortality. Um, the, the industry analyses we've done, it's closer to 50 to 60% in most areas for reproductive rate and up to 10% for mortality rate. So if you're there and you know that's what the numbers are, you know you've got a problem and can address it. So this is part of the barrier to adoption, is not being aware you've got a problem because you don't know your stock numbers. And if you're going to match stocking rate to carrying capacity, you need to know your stock numbers. Focus on herd productivity, so the efficiency there, not just numbers. Um, focusing on kilos of beef per AE per year. How good is that production system of converting grass into beef? The better producers are better at turning grass into beef, and therefore they generate more income per animal unit and have higher profits. Ensure the discretionary herd expenditure is well targeted. Supplementation, animal health, genetics, um, that sort of thing. The top producers spend less there, but they get more in productivity. So making sure it's spent well, and that's where your expertise collectively can offer a lot in that area. Where to spend money, but make sure it's cost effective. Yes, we can have fantastic growth rates, but if we're spending more on it than what we're getting back, it's not worthwhile. So getting that um, spend effective, making sure the incremental benefit exceeds the cost. That's something the top performers do quite well. Efficient use of labour. Biggest um, driver of costs for beef producers. If a beef business isn't done, if each full-time equivalent of labour that goes into the business isn't managing between 1500 and 2500 AE, then there's a problem with labour efficiency that's impacting their bottom line. And the top performers do that well. Operating scale, those first four, we talk about them in terms of operating efficiency. They can be done independent of scale. Scale is important and it is a constraint for many businesses. It's not an insurmountable constraint. Being aware of if it is a constraint and what to do about it is, um, is important, but that is necessary to have a, um, a good business. If a beef business can tick each of those boxes, they're going to make good money through the cycle. Everyone's making money at the moment if they've got cattle, but through the full cycle, if a business can tick all of them, they're going to be making money. Um, price received is largely a distraction overall and shouldn't have much attention focused on it, I don't think. Um, what else can you do? Have a broad understanding of the key research and published papers relevant to your role, industry and region. You can't be across the 100,000 that get published each year or go back and catch up on the 13,000 MLA reports over Christmas, but get across the key ones that are there have a library of research and published papers. This is something that um, I found quite useful in recent years. Get EndNote and start putting everything together. It's a great way to, to collate everything, have stuff there if you need to, to get it. Contribute to the literature. I'm a bit hypocritical here because I haven't done as much of this as I want to, but I, I have and will do more. If you come up with something or you see something, put it out there. That's important. Build a relationship with the specialists. If you, you don't have to know everything and you can't but know those people who do know, so you can ring up Tim. Right, I've got this question on EBVs. 
or whoever the case may be, to be able to pull that in so you can access them rather than you be across it, that team agriculture approach. And you, in some ways your role is to be the translator between the scientist and the, um, or the researcher and the practitioners. Um, we took a, um, a group of producers, and Tim helped out with this, down to Agbo, Agbu, a couple of years ago and went through some stuff there and it was fantastic. Got a lot of stuff, um, but the, the feedback we got from them was no more scientists after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to be the translator in there between the two. Um, demand evidence and assess the economics. Um, advocate for the scientific process, which Dennis will take you through. Acknowledge its shortcomings. It isn't perfect, it's slow, it's time consuming, but it um, has stood the test of time. Encourage people into science and agriculture and economics. We need bright minds that see the big picture, not narrow. We need the big picture. Attend events like this. Look at professional accreditation. The Ag Institute has done a fair bit of this in recent years, which I'm a big advocate of, the certified practicing agriculturalists and chartered agriculturalists. Become recognised as a professional, or in whatever your field is. I think that's important. Um, <clears throat> and to finish up, I think also beware of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Is anyone familiar with this? Seen this? A few hands go up. I think it's great. So what we've got here is confidence and knowledge. So we start out, we find something, we look at it, right up. I'm across it. I know everything. That's good. Move on to the next one. Then you say, oh, hang on, you look into it a bit more. A bit more to this than I thought. Then you get down to rock bottom. I'm never going to understand this. <laughs> and you say, okay, it's starting to make sense. And trust me, it's complicated. <laughs> and I think we've all ridden that roller coaster on different things. I think it's important to be aware of it and where you sit. And the bit I like about this graph is you never get back up to where you thought you were at the start. <laughs> so maybe this is potential and that's reality. There. So um, suggested readings, these are in your notes to um, um, go and have a look at if you want. And you'll know a lot of others, but yeah, you can't get across everything, but I think it's important to to get across some of them. So Sally's given me the wind up, so I'll pull up there for any questions.